I, I found that uh, you know that it was just kind of easy to fall into some of the the traps of the old paradigm. Uh, at, at the time, I didn't know it was an old paradigm. I just started building software the way I always had, and I started getting questions from people who said, "Yeah, you can just store your personal information in this system, and we'll kind of help you share it." And and uh, we, this is kind of the time when um, we had. Um, uh, we had, um, we call it the surveillance economy, um, where we were being watched, um, because this is how you best market it to, to me, is by watching how I browse websites. Um, this was about the time when Edward Snowden had kind of revealed some disconcerting news about what uh, the, the U.S. government um, was doing in terms of spying on citizens. And um, the sea of data breaches. Uh, you know, we had uh, all kinds of, you know, Target and Ashley Madison, and and all of this personally identifiable information was being um, just kind of um, exploited. And we were up against it. We asked ourselves, how could we, how could we, in good conscience, just say, um, it's okay, just trust us, uh, because we'll we'll have the best firewalls and we'll do the best, um, have the best kind of controls. Uh, we'll, we'll hire the best assignments and, and we'll do it better than anybody else. Uh, so this was right about the time that uh, uh, Richard Branson had done a, kind of an off-site retreat in his, one of his islands and he had a, a group of, uh, of people go and he talked about the, what are the, really the applications of blockchain. And one of the big ones that came out of it was identity. We thought, okay, can we, can we help solve this problem with blockchain? And admittedly, we were very naive. When we first started jumping in, we started putting identifiers and public keys and assertions directly on the blockchain. And uh, we thought this was great because what we'll do is we'll encrypt some data. Um, a driver license administration can just say that I'm legal to drive or I'm a certain age. And I can encrypt that information and put it on a public ledger and then I can just point someone to it. And I can say, here's the key, go look at it. And you can see the driver license division says that I'm old enough to, to walk into this bar or something. Uh, but, but then, uh, a realization hit us. If we do this, we would create. Um, I can't read that. It, it, just, it, just, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <It's happening. laughs> um, <clears throat> two big problems hit us really hard, and the biggest one is this one: the correlation risk. Um, if I'm sharing the same uh, unique information with multiple parties, then it's easy for them to correlate. Me. Uh, it's easy for them to uh, share information about me with each other, and it wouldn't be um, some some uh, uh, it wouldn't be nefarious. What they would do is they tell me that hey, if if you uh, here's our privacy, here's our terms and conditions, here's our privacy policy, and in there, 60 pages down, would be something that says we share your information with our partners in order to help you. Uh, provide better services for you. And, um, and, and we realized that what we were doing is creating something that could ultimately make the privacy problem much, much worse. So and then we're also concerned about performance, which I'll talk about. So what, uh, one of the things that we did to help with this on the performance side, and I'll go back to privacy, was um, taking um, agents, or taking, um, let me describe what agents are first. I think that would be good. Um, agents are a, a bit of logic that work for me. They're trusted uh, by me. They run for me. They work for me. Think of agents as, um, uh, a, a good, uh, uh, one way to think about this is, uh, has anybody here seen Iron Man? Yes. Iron Man. Uh, and, and you know Tony Stark has his uh, his computer companion. What's his companion's name? Jarvis. What is it? Jarvis. Jarvis. So Jarvis works for Tony, and and that's that's an important distinction. He doesn't work for Google. 
or Amazon or uh, someone else who works for Tony. Now, I think in one of the episodes, uh, he worked for someone else, Ultron or something. But um, um, anyway, um, Jarvis um, was focused on Tony and helping Tony do what he needed to do. Um, and, and so this is an important kind of paradigm shift because right now, the services that we use today, I have a phone and what's, you know, when I'm driving, it's transmitting some information about where I am and, and then it's kind of telling me where the traffic is and where the accidents are. But, uh, I mean, my information, um, I don't know what's being shared. And, and it's a little disconcerting. And I'd rather have, if, my, if I wanted to have something that helped me navigate, I'd rather have that go through an agent that can anonymize some of my information and do collective intelligence types of, of, of things so that I'm in control of that information and I get to contribute at a level that, I, that works for me. And this kind of uh, speaks to the notion of self-sovereign identity, where uh, I'm in much more control. <coughs> um, this also allowed us to move interactions off ledger. So um, when you have a blockchain, people's first uh, inclination is to start writing things to the ledger. And they think anything that you would write into a database, you just stick on this, this blockchain. Um, but you only need to put things on the ledger that have an ordering requirement, um, a, a double spend proof requirement, um, so that when I spend money, I can only spend it one time. Uh, but if I'm sending, if Alice is sending a message to Bob, um, is there a double spend requirement? Is the order terribly important? And, and so where it's not important, then you can do direct interaction between agents and not even go through the ledger. But you use the ledger to know that you've got a verified, that you can actually verify that that came from Alice or came from Bob. Um, and this also reduced uh, an attack vector, um, more of a kind of side channel attack where um, watching the timing of transactions can lead to inferences that let you uh, know more than um, you really ought to. Uh, so we talk about, this is, this is kind of the heart of what we've done and we've spent, um, we have gone much slower than we wanted to with Sovereign because of this issue. And it's, it's a hard issue and um, it's, it's made it very difficult to move as fast as we originally had planned. But it's about correlation risk and it's about privacy. You can't have a public ledger and throw in a bunch of stuff that can be easily uh, mined and turned into information that can hurt you. So we needed pairwise identifiers and keys. So in a relationship, um, so Alex and I have a relationship. It could be a, a, a very simple working relationship or it could be a friendship or whatever, but I have an identifier I use with him and with Brian I have a different identifier. And I use different keys and I use different endpoints. And I don't, I don't share them between each other. And that's an important, it's an important thing. Uh, for that correlation uh, that we talked about. But more importantly, um, signatures are correlatable. So when the driver license division says that I'm, I'm licensed to drive, and I provide that proof to someone, I want that person that I provide that to, to be able to verify it's from the driver license division. If I give them a signature, they can verify that that's true, but that signature is unique to my credential, my driver license. So that's, that's, pretty, uh, that's pretty important to understand. And so what we needed was a different type of signature, um, something that was portable across relationships and was unlinkable. So that when I, when I go in, this is not my driver license, but let's say that it is. If I go into a bar and I hold up my license, that license, um, the bartender is looking at it and um, probably not remembering it. Um, and I can even cover up like my address if I'm worried that the bartender is going to be a stalker and, and chase me home or something. But um, I have the ability to show something and then it just kind of goes away. And it's really not linkable between two bartenders. Now, move it to a digital credential. A digital credential says, hey, I'm showing this, but I'm, maybe I'm scanning it under something. And then they can record that. And it's going into a system. 
that has is probably the same system that other bars down the street are using, and then you have this kind of uh, opportunity to sell extra services that allow for pooling of that data and correlation of that data. Um, another thing, another reason why it's important that it's unlinkable is um, in some parts of the world there are regime changes where it may be fine for the driver license division to know um, that I'm using my driver license to go to certain places um, under one regime, but if there's a, an election and there's a new leader, it may all of a sudden not be fine. And, uh, and that was a real consideration, um, especially with kind of the, some of the things that are happening in the world today. So, um, who's here, who here has heard of uh, zero knowledge proofs? Okay. Oh, wow. All right. So, this is, this is, like I said, this is kind of where my head has been for uh, a couple of years now. Um, what you can do with zero knowledge proofs is prove that you have a license without actually showing your license. And, and the, the term zero knowledge means that there's nothing that's leaked. You prove just the thing you want to prove, but nothing else. Uh, and this is really important. It creates that unlinkability feature that we talked about. An example of this is um, prove that you have a driver license. I can prove that my driver license is not expired. I can prove, I can disclose just my postal code. I can prove that I'm over 18. Um, and, and you can even go so far as to, your driver license might have a birth date on it, but I can prove that that birth date is far enough in the past to make me 18 without sharing with you my birth date. And uh, a friend of, of uh, Brian and, and, and mine, uh, and Alex on too, is, is fond of using the term exotic crypto. Um, it is more advanced cryptography than you're probably using in your browsers today, um, but it's cryptography that's been around for a couple of, of decades, and or more actually. Um, but it's really exciting you can do this. Now, now why, why am I talking so much about privacy? Because it's not, um, in most cases, it's not so much about the um, trying to be anonymous as it is about um, having a technology that doesn't force you to be strongly identified every time you use your identi identity. Uh, so uh, this is uh, kind of, here's some examples of some things that, I'll, I'll show that in a second. Another thing is you need to have revocation. If there's, um, let's say a driver license was incorrect, had the wrong information, or uh, a doctor um, who was a licensed doctor lost their license. Um, you know, uh, you know. Let's say somebody hacked the, the, the ticketing system and they printed a whole bunch of digital tickets. Um, this is the kind of thing that we need um, to be able to revoke, and we have to revoke it in zero knowledge. That's <coughs> so, um, before this talk. Uh, uh, we were, a few of us were talking about kind of some interesting applications of this technology. Uh, right now in Hollywood, you have uh, uh, kind of a, you've heard of the V2? Mm -hmm. Is this, yeah? Okay. So um, it's, pretty, it's, it's pretty crazy how much, um, how widespread this kind of went on. And with, um, with this technology, uh, a whistleblower app is actually quite possible. So here's how it can work. You can prove that you are an employee of a certain company and, and, then, t and then disclose some information without disclosing anything else, without disclosing who you are. Uh, and, and so you could say, hey, I'm, a, I'm a, uh, an employee of Harvey Weinstein and uh, uh, here's some information that's important to share. Um, Another thing where this could be really useful is, is for companies that um, want to get ahead of any issues, and they have kind of a, a HR could do this. HR could say, hey, um, we're going to issue an employment credential to everyone who's an employee. And then this kind of is a, a way for you to prove that you're an employee and disclose some information. 
And, and even if Harvey Weinstein didn't um, do it, at least they, someone could go check in on what's going on and at least have some conversation. The whistleblower is, I think, a huge thing. And, and you can't link these things. This is what's so great about the cryptography. Uh, safe voting is a fun one. You can, with these credentials, um, when sovereign, is you could go do a registration at a voting voter registration. And you could pull out all of your you know, detailed tax records and everything that you need to, to prove that you are a certain person. And then you could go um, and, and they can issue you a credential, a voting credential. And then later, you can go vote, and that vote, you can prove that you're registered to vote without disclosing any other information about yourself. Uh, there's some places, I think, in the world where this is really, really important. Um, you don't want voter intimidation, and, and so this, this is kind of a neat one for me. I, I feel like, like there's some, some need for this. Uh, safe biometric authentication. Let's say you have a, a, a passport. I don't have mine on me, but uh, my picture's on my passport. But if, if I need to prove something that's on my passport, but my picture's kind of really um, self-identifying. It shows a lot about me, and, and uh, that's, that's pretty identifying. But um, if I'm trying to gain online access using my passport, the relying party could ask me to go and um, and uh, go to an authentication provider that could actually look at my biometric and could uh, strongly identify me. I could hold up my passport and tilt my head and wink and do my testing. And they could issue a credential right then against my passport that has a timestamp on it, also against the, um, the um, so maybe some challenge from the original relying party. So that in the end, the relying party can know, have really strong assurance that it's me without knowing who I am. So there's some really cool uh, applications. Um, coupons and vouchers. Another one is um, receipts. Uh, I'm a company. What if I use Sovereign to issue receipts? Um, so I printed out a receipt, but I give you a digital receipt. What is a receipt but uh, a credential that proves you bought something? And what's nice about that is you can then go and do a product review of a product that you actually own. And you can have a, a better product reputation because it's confirmed that you actually own the product that you're reviewing. Uh, we got pushback, um, especially early on, a lot less now. Um, they said zero knowledge crypto is hard. They'll correlate you anyway. Uh, and we just said, uh, okay, but let's keep going. Let's keep going because we believe this is this is valuable and necessary. Um, and what we're finding is that we're um, we're meeting uh, companies and governments and people that say that this is the thing that's really important to them, and uh, and it's become something that they realized they've absolutely needed. Um, a few other challenges we ran into and things we learned over time. Um, uh, how do you keep like a service provider from impersonating you? Um, we talked about agents earlier. Agents have their own keys. Um, we never copy those keys. Um, and then we differentiate between cloud agents and edge agents. So let me talk about agents for a minute. This gets a little bit technical, but I, I think it's, it's probably useful. Um, this phone, this is a, a, a phone that has a lot of computing power, information, has some keys on it. When I prove something about myself, um, I want to be able to use my phone to do that. But I don't want, um, if I'm using a service provider that's using a cloud service, I don't want that cloud service to be able to do high trust activity. Um, I also have another, another problem with this phone, is this phone is, is um, it runs out of battery, um, I may be out of cell range, uh, and so it's important that, um, that I have maybe something that could be used, like a can cloud agent that could be used for low trust activities like message storing and, and forwarding when I'm back online. So we have to start making a differentiation between cloud agents and edge agents. 
And we found that by having these and being able to compose them in different ways, it solved some real challenges for us uh, for some of these use cases. Um, uh, again, a little bit, little bit technical here. Um, if you have a key per relationship and a key per agent, and everybody has this, then you've got everybody in the world multiplied by all of their relationships, multiplied by all of their devices. Um, you, can, you can imagine it's pretty big. So we call this key explosion, and there's a few things we've done to solve this. Um, HD keys, microledgers, and DKMS. So um, anybody involved with uh, Bitcoin um, probably has knows about uh, Bit32. Uh, this is a, a Bitcoin improvement proposal 32, which deals with hierarchical deterministic wallets. Um, this is something that uh, um, one of our team and I wrote. Um, on how to do bit 32 on an elliptic curve that's not quite um, as easy as the Bitcoin curve. Um, this is a site, if you're interested, called safecurves.cr.yp.to. Last three characters, last um, six characters are, are crypto. Um, that is kind of an analysis of safe elliptic curves. So, again, it's a little technical, but um, we had to go pretty deep with this stuff to, to make sure that we had um, uh, the right kind of uh, guarantees in place. Um, Microledgers are interesting. Microledgers allow you to do things you normally would do on a blockchain, but do them out at the edge. Um, it's almost like blockchain is about decentralization, but um, microledgers and agents actually take decentralization to the next level which is where you actually have kind of a, a, a mesh of, of ledgers that are actually living off of the blockchain. Um, one, thing, one thing to note too is my phone has, um, if I have my identity on my phone, what happens when my phone is lost? Um, does that mean I have to, I've lost my identity? Or what happens, you know, I, I use my phone to unlock my phone, but, but my phone contains uh, fingerprints on it. So kind of the, the thing to unlock my phone is actually on my phone itself. Um, so how do I recover if I've, I've lost my phone or someone has compromised it? Uh, and so we've been um, working on, a, a, we call it DKMS. It's a standard for um, uh, decentralized key management and using Sovereign and some protocols running on devices, um, we think we have some, some really great answers for how do I provision a new agent, how do I um, change my keys, how do I recover if I lose my phone, um, how can I use my trusted relationships, like my, my friends and family and my bank and um, others that uh, other institutions that I trust, how can I use them to kind of build my own little network in a way that doesn't feel clumsy, but I can say, hey, I've got a friend, Alex, he's going he's gonna to help me recover my identity if I ever lose it. And I'm going to do the same thing for him. Uh, and, and Alex can't do it all by himself. Um, he's got to find two of my other friends to go with him to recover my identity. Um, and I, maybe it's, it's three of my five friends that have to come together uh, to be able to do that. So this is kind of advanced stuff and building apps and building protocols that allow for uh, kind of sophisticated identity recovery is, is uh, uh, something we've been spending a lot of time on. Um, so who knows the difference between permission and permissionless? Okay, this, all right, this is good, all right. Um, so this, is, this was an interesting design decision. So early on, um, we were looking at uh, permissionless ledgers. But one of the big concerns we had was cost, um, because we were concerned about transaction fees rising, and throughput. How many transactions can we support? When you're building uh, an identity, uh, a distributed ledger just for identity, um, 
what I didn't want, what we didn't want to have happen was someone, well, <laughs> what you didn't want to have happen was for the price of Bitcoin to go up so high that um, a single write to the Bitcoin ledger would cost 40 US dollars, um, which is kind of what's happened. But it's come down, it's a little more rational now. But here's, here's the issue. When you're dealing with identity, you've got to have a way for uh, someone who's uh, uh, a rickshaw driver making four euros a day to be able to uh, to uh, do something with their identity with without feeling like it's a hardship, a financial hardship. Um, so built into the trust framework for Sovereign is uh, instructions that, that say you have to keep the price of basic identity transactions down. Um, that's critical. Um, it doesn't work as a global public utility for identity unless the cost stays down. Um, and so there's, there's ways that uh, we're ensuring that that happens. Now, um, there's, there, the big question with public permission was, well, first of all, I talked about lowering costs. Um, I wrote a paper, there's a, there's a uh, biannual, um, biannual, no, semi-annual uh, workshop called Rebooting Love of Trust. Um, it's, it's put on by uh, a number of, of, well, actually, it's put on by uh, Christopher Allen uh, of Blockstream. Um, we've had great um, uh, contributions in that for the last four years, or last, I guess, two, two and a half years. Um, and I wrote a paper called uh, called Optimizing, or, um, yeah, Optimizing a, uh, a VFT Protocol for Identity. Uh, VFT stands for Byzantine Fault Tolerance. Um, and I talk about sharding. So there's a lot of kind of research that goes into this uh, and stuff, but um, I'd recommend if you're interested in this, um, just look up Rebooting Love of Trust in, in my name. Um, it allows for global scale. But the big drawback to a permission ledger is um, a, couple of, a couple of drawbacks. One is how is it governed? And the governance is a question for any blockchain. Okay? It doesn't matter if, um, if it's permissionless. There's still the question of governance. Uh, and, and, you know, pool consolidation and uh, co-contributors and how is that managed? That's, that's, that's still a question. Um, but but um, what we did, we did two things. And, I, and, and inside of these two things are other things, but uh, we formed the Sovereign Foundation, an international nonprofit. Um, where we have uh, 12 trustees around the world uh, that are really, um, their job is to govern the network and to put in place the, uh, the policy, uh, actually implement the policy that's found in the Sovereign Trust Framework. So the Sovereign Trust, I'll show you a link here. Um, the Trust Framework is a document that contains the business, legal and technical requirements uh, for sovereign. And what's interesting about the trust framework is it's actually starting to serve as the base point for other trust frameworks built on top of it. Um, and this is kind of an emerging space um, in the legal world because um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of these out there. There are a few out there, like seven uh, worldwide right now. Um, this is seventh or eighth, um, but we see a proliferation of trust frameworks over time, and so um, we wanted to have a really good one to be the basis for uh, trust frameworks that are built on top of sovereign. Um, here is uh, here is the trust framework site. Um, it's hard to read the sovereign.org and library trust framework. I recommend taking a look at it, especially if you have uh, people in your orbit who are. Um, uh, regulatory or legal requirements. Um, we're getting feedback from people who are reviewing this all over the world. Uh, this is a huge effort. Um, the provisional trust framework uh, has been done for a while, uh, but we're now working on the general availability trust framework, uh, and we've got people from uh, governments and uh, companies and you know privacy rights groups all over working on the trust framework. Uh, I listed the stewards here. Um, this, the notion of a steward is really in a permission ledger. Um, 
you have an organization that's responsible for running a node. Um, and, and running a node doesn't mean that you're the only one who gets the right to it, and that's kind of the difference with uh, Sovereign, is it's, it's a public ledger. Anybody can write to it, but you have a, a collection of nodes that are, are the actual validators. And they, they are basically volunteers that have come forward and said, um, I believe in the mission of Sovereign, I believe in what you stand for, I want to participate, I want to help, and they're providing diversity of the network by standing up nodes all over the world. Um, I, don't, I don't think we have one in Spain yet. Uh, I don't have to go to Spain. Um, several in uh, the Netherlands, uh, Finland, um, the US, uh, Austria, uh, Singapore, um, anyway, it's, it's all over. And, and what's important for the protocol to be secure is you have to have a diversity of, of, uh, of legal jurisdiction. Um, so you can't have one, one legal jurisdiction that can have a, 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 a significant impact on the ledger. Um, also, if there's a natural disaster, you don't want to have an earthquake take out half the network. Um, you want to have diversity of, of operating systems diversity if, they're, if you're using a cloud provider, diversity of that. So this kind of helps keep the network safe, um, is just making sure that you've got that kind of diversity. And you've also got diversity of industry. Um, I can't scroll on this. And it's important, I mean, this is a, a law firm, this is a, a credit union innovation group, um, this is Crypto Valley in Switzerland, um, KYC chain um, in Hong Kong, um, I respond in Washington, uh, InfoCert um, in Italy, uh, ATP Financial in Canada. So you can see that um, you know that you've got kind of a diversity of, of uh, industry as well. And then um, the other kind of part of governance is the code. Um, this is open source code. It's uh, permissive open source, meaning it's like a, a BSD or MIT or Apache 2. Uh, there's a few others that are really permissive, meaning um, you can do whatever you want with the code. It doesn't stop you. Uh, it, it doesn't stop you from um, taking it and kind of co-opting it and doing whatever you want with it. Um, it's Apache 2. It's a Hyperledger project, which is under the Linux Foundation. Um, they're a great organization uh, when we joined. Um, so this is Indie. Um, when we joined, it was Sovereign. And they said, um, we don't like that there might be a trademark issue, because you have the Sovereign Foundation, and now Sovereign is inside of <coughs> Hyperledger. And so we said, OK, let's change the name. So that's why it's a different name. Um, but in actuality, Indie is a code base for Sovereign. And you could stand up. You know, for testing or even uh, a competitor to Sovereign if you wanted to um, uh, using this code base. Um, I don't think you'd want to. I don't think, you know, if, if we do it right with Sovereign, then we don't need um, to have more than one, but um, you could do it. And um, the Hyperledger uh, uh, project is a great group with that good, good governance and, and very smart people working on it. We're collaborating with people all over the world. Um, you know, what's great is you've got. Intel, um, IBM, uh, it's like four or five other um, uh, initiatives inside of Hyperledger, and we're all bringing stuff to the table. Um, it's great because there's a you know really smart cryptographers in in uh, um, IBM's Zurich research team that are co contributing code, and we're able to see that code and leverage that and contribute our own code and work together to solve a real a real problem. So, Hyperledger is a great, a great initiative. Um, and uh, here's, here's code base. This is Indie Node. Um, there's like five uh, repos um, um, uh, uh, for Indie under Hyperledger. You can kind of see the activity. You can see how many people are contributing and uh, kind of watch, see how, how much activity is happening there. And we would love your help. Um, this is an open source project. We love you to bring things to the table. Um, there's also a Jira. Jira is a kind of a ticket management uh, system that has hundreds of tickets in it, things we want to see improved on, it, things we want to do, uh, bug fixes, uh, performance fixes, things like that. So we'd love your help. 
Um, there's also some more links, and I think these slides will be made available, Alex, so you don't have to write all these down. But, uh, Um, lastly, I just want to come back to why we're doing this. It's not about identity. Identity is not a destination. Um, and, and, and let me just say one more thing before that. Um, when we talk about identity, we think of things like login. But, but login is, is one use of identity, or maybe something under the identity umbrella. Um, it's, um, it's more than login. It's, um, it's a shift. Self-sovereign identity is about a shift to um, changing the balance of power between a person who's in a browser working with a service provider or a website, changing that balance of power. So instead of me logging into their identity about me, it's me bringing my identity to the table and me deciding how much I want to disclose and, and us being on equal terms and me being able to disengage when I want to. Um, it's about peer-to-peer -peer interaction. It's about mutual authentication, um, and it's it's it goes much further than um, login. It's it's about what's enabled by it. It's about what you can do with it, um, and we're finding uh, amazing use cases uh, when we deal with um, with sovereign because we we created um, and the contributors to this project have created a rich landscape of of capability that when you put it together uh, can solve some real problems. So it's it's a pleasure for me. I'm grateful to be a part of the team and working on such a project. And thanks for having me. One question regarding the agents. Can you explain more or less a practical use case of an agent being autonomous, for example? So use case maybe going buying something or some interaction that uh, really explains the how autonomous is <coughs> an agent in a use case, uh, in a real use case. Okay, um, about uh, about 40 pounds ago, um, I was a runner, and uh, I would go running with, uh, in, in, and I was a distance runner, and I, I would go uh, 50 miles um, at times. And there were times when I would go do a training run that was 40 miles long, and I would be going in the mountains, and uh, you know there were times when I would say to my lovely wife, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be going this route, and if you don't hear from me by tomorrow morning, then um, then you'll know where I am. But I always change my mind. And so uh, one use case that I love is one where instead of my GPS coordinates going to some server somewhere, mm -hmm. it's going to some cloud agent that I have that runs for me. And if I don't show up, I've given it rights to share that information with my wife so my wife can see it. Um, so that's kind of one use of it, but I think agents can go much further. Um, you think of AI. Um, AI is used a lot of times to um, help um, recognize patterns uh, under great amounts of, of data sets. Um, why can't an AI work for me? Why can't an AI learn about how I use uh, my things? Why can't an AI work that says, this is how I travel? What an AI could know um, that I need to get some milk on the way home, and it could know that I'm leaving for home and tell me, remind me right when I'm leaving that I need to get the milk on the way home. Um, those are the kinds of things that you know computers can help us do, but um, it shouldn't be feeding my details to a server uh, owned by someone else. So that means more or less that the agent must be trained with somehow rules that you allow them or not to do things on several situations. Yeah, I mean, people are going to have to write these, and, and agents, the concept of agents, agents have extensions. Um, so I can have, think of an agent as kind of like a, a, a container where I can load um, uh, an extension. And another example of an extension could be just something like uh, uh, a decentralized app. Um, I could have a, a game of chess that I could play with my friend, um, and we could use these, these two different extensions running on my agent and his agent, and we don't have to have a server. Uh, we don't have to go through a server to, to do that. 
um, who our agents can just facilitate that directly. Um, so I, I envision that in the long run, um, and even the medium term, we have, um, we'll have people building these uh, applications that we run on our own agents to do the kinds of things we want done. Good question. Uh, yes, uh, and my question is basically about uh, adoption. Uh, what are the challenges that you are feeling that you have to make this uh, adopted, let's say, by mass markets? I don't know who are you targeting to. Um, also, what are that strategy or tacticals that you have in mind to at least start reaching uh, a meaningful early adoption? Yeah. So I, um, when I talk about this, I talk about it from the perspective of the end user, right? The person that's an individual. Um, that's kind of where the passion comes from. That's been my own my own uh, driver. But um, we also what we found is this really cool. Um, this thing we discovered was that when businesses use this. Um, they actually get a richer interaction with the customer. If the customer can leave whenever they want and they have great control, um, then then they actually end up having a, a better relationship with that. It actually encourages the business to um, behave in a more proper way. Um, now, this regulation, and I think I think regulation is is good, but um, you know GDPR I think really has teeth. Um, a little bit later this year, um, and, and that's a good thing, but I, I don't think that, um, I, I, kind of, I kind of think there should be a, a virtuous cycle, and when good things, when you do good things, you get good things, and, and I think that um, by having a, a, a balanced relationship, a peer-to-peer -peer relationship, then you start to get this happening. Um, so I, I, what's interesting also is that, um, we have banks and um, you know businesses and governments coming to us asking us for this. Um, it's really kind of a, a, a nice time in the in the kind of the digital um, world that you have institutions that are coming to us and saying things like, "We believe that our customers' data belongs to them. We don't want to have um, the liability of holding on to data that that uh, is theirs." Um, you know, PII is toxic, as they say, personally identifiable information. And so, um, because they're coming to us and asking for this, um, we're able to give them an, an opportunity to use it. Now, the way it would be, um, you kind of get some adoption, is that an institution would say, this is how we're doing our logging. This is how you, you, know, you can use sovereign, you use your self-sovereign identity to do a login. So institutions are asking us, how can we make it so that um, instead of using our login system, why don't we use Sovereign to do that? And so when your bank says, here's your new banking app, and, and you actually can log in using Sovereign on your banking app, you kind of get pretty good adoption that way. And then when you kind of discover that, hey, um, my banking app is using this Sovereign thing, and, um, and my uh, utility company is using the Sovereign thing, and oh, by the way, I can start to use these credentials across um, into other spaces. I think that's kind of an emergent scenario where um, that's kind of a, uh, uh, you know, I think that, that can really happen. I think it can be a really neat thing. You can really have one wallet for your identity. So I don't know that it's going to be driven from the individual. I don't think the individual is going to say, I demand to have self sovereign identity because not very many of us know about it, right? And I think there, there is also an issue about trust there as regarded the individuals because, of course, people that know about blockchains can understand that, dude, this makes sense. Yeah. But, uh, and the thing about theory and all approach, you still need to uh, uh, trust the network somehow. So, and the skeptical guy, non technical. Yeah, yeah um, you know, those, are, those are challenges. If you look at the. Um, how long have we had, um, uh, you know, we've had browsers for a long time, we've had TLS for a long time, um, and, and how long did it take us to get the little lock showing up and to get browsers really saying things like, don't go to this site, the certificate's expired, right? 
it, it took a long time. We were like just kind of clicking right through. Um, so our apps, it is kind of warm in here. Um, sorry, guys. Um, it's all the hot air coming from me, I'm sure. But the, um, the apps have to get really good at helping people understand um, security. And what I'm doing is public is saying that, here's an example, I've, I've sharded my identity in a way that um, if I lose my phone, I need two of them, three of my friends to be able to recover it. Um, my friend shouldn't get an email from me saying, hey, go ahead and recover my identity, and he, he shouldn't be able to do that. It needs to be something where the app itself is asking questions like, have you talked to Jason? Um, you, how did he sound when you talked to him? And there needs to be kind of some real um, innovation in terms of uh, user experience where we're really understanding that there was a, this is, this is not easy stuff. And uh, key management is one of the hardest things to do well, and we're talking about key management for end users, and that's a tough problem, and that's why we're spending so much energy on it. My question is, uh, do you really think that, I, 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 I understand that you are but a big institution, a big corporation, at the end, very big part of their business is the data. So it's very hard to believe that they will support uh, the, the switch to yeah. some sovereign identity. Even banks, for when you said banks were interested in that, it's hard for me to... <laughs> uh, um, it, so I think the wrong institutions will... Um, I should, maybe I shouldn't say that. Um, some institutions will, will not like this. Um, some institutions won't like the regulation. Um, I think when you have regulation that says this is how it needs to be done, um, institutions that don't respect uh, privacy, don't respect um, who owns the data, um, are still kind of subject to those regulations. And so they'll look for some solutions. And I think there are people working on GDPR solutions on top of Sovereign right now. Um, that's, a, that's an important thing. Um, when you asked about, um, it's hard to believe that, that banks would, would do that. Um, a, a bank, I mean, that's kind of interesting. Uh, we are working with uh, the credit union uh, associations in the United States. Um, you would think that, but they're coming to us and saying things like, um, like I said before, we believe that uh, a customer is, um, you know, ha has the right to their own data. Um, we had a large financial institution in the U.S. Um, came to us and said, we think if they if they leave our our organization, they should be able to take their data with them. And um, I think there's some regulation that says they have to retain certain records for a certain period of time. But and they'll do that because they have to. But um, I, I think I think it, the landscape's changed. I, I don't think it's a big data, <coughs> uh, big data mining type of thing happening with the financial institutions like like we saw. Maybe. <coughs> I don't know. I, maybe it's not true for all financial institutions, but um, it's surprising how many um, are all saying the same things and they're jumping on board. So maybe it won't be up to the individuals to decide what kind of information they should give to the companies who demand it. Maybe it should be a regulation to, to set up this, like for institutions, say for the driving, the drivers you only need to know if they have the, uh, the, say the permit to drive and know how old is he or where he lives, yeah. for example. But that should come then from regulation, not from the user. Uh. Yeah, so, so there's a concept that I call safe proving. Um, and the amount of information that you reveal should be commensurate with the type of interaction you have. Um, there are already um, laws and regulations about what kinds of information you're um, allowed to ask for in certain situations, but it's not very widespread. Um, one of the ideas is could we have a reputation around the request for information? And so, could you have someone that that uh, that uh, is able to to say that hey, this is a, a legitimate request for this type of information? 
this is a legitimate request for this type of information. Um, but in this other scenario, um, you know, if you're, you should be able to kind of match things up. And, and it could be someone uh, simply saying, um, this is too much. I'm just going to just flag it. And there could be some reservation there. Um, or um, one thing that, that we're looking at, too, is um, trying to create some templates and have those templates be, be things that people can vote on and say, for this type of interaction, um, this is how much information you can ask for. And I think that's going to evolve. I mean, that's, that's kind of more advanced thinking, but that's going to evolve over time. And certainly regulation um, can play a part of that. Mm -hmm. I have a question. It's more about the blockchain in general. It's true that blockchain is safe, or we're safe, and I don't know if think that it's true. But what happened uh, with the data before entering the blockchain? I, I, I'm going to say a sample. I need to store data from a, I don't know, for a bank. Uh, he sent me a JSON information. What happened in the, uh, from the moment that the JSON go out from the bank and enter in the blockchain? Okay, the blockchain is, is, is safe, but the trouble between uh, institutions that send you that uh, and the moment that it is safe in the blockchain, what happens? You have to use the security systems. You so have the problem on the security too, because it's in the trouble, you have to really have a problem. So, um, that's it's kind of a, a bit of a misconception. So what he was asking is, is uh, um, when you get information from a bank, would it be like or whatever a data from a bank that is not in the your server or a, a different institution? Yeah. You have to say to take information, for example, from a I don't know a university or a like like a, like a, a, a transcript from the university. I don't know. For example. Uh, you say, I'm going to take information of the Ministry of, of from a hospital, and I want to take the information of, of a patient. And you take the information, for example, with a JSON. You ask to them, tell me the information of this patient, and I'm going to save it on the blockchain. So that's, that's I want to kind of um, talk about that. Just the, the first thing people think to do is store it on the blockchain. Um, that was kind of the, the, where we started. We started with that approach. Um, and we realized that the blockchain isn't great for storage. Blockchain is great for helping us know what the current keys are. And so when someone sends us some information, um, how do I know it's really from that someone? Well, how can you change it? Right. And if they've, if they've rotated their keys 30 minutes ago, it's a different key. Um, and then I get the message from the old key then I can know that that's, that's not a trustworthy message. So the, the distributed ledger actually um, does less in this interaction than we think. Um, so the, the bank giving you, or the hospital giving you some kind of proof of vaccination, or giving you a credential so that you can prove that you're vaccinated, um, you could go, and this is where the agents, and there's an agent-to-agent -agent communication protocol. And it's a, it's a very secure protocol, and we'll be publishing this, uh, this uh, next week. We'll get this out there, um, put it on the website. Uh, actually, we'll be in GitHub. Part of it's already in GitHub, but uh, it'll be more prominent. But it, with the agent to agent protocol, you can communicate from one agent to the other, even over an unsecure line, and you can know that that message uh, hasn't been tampered with, and that it can only be read by the recipient. Um, and so you, when, you, when the hospital issues that credential of vaccination, it goes to you, you store it, um, and you store it in the vault. And the vault could be something that's hosted, the vault could be something um, in a bank, or it could be um, stored on the device directly. If you had three devices, you could probably just store those credentials in your devices, and you know if you lost one, you still have copies of the others. And then when someone says, proof that you've been vaccinated, you keep it on your vault, you open it up, and then you generate a proof and send that to them using that same agent-to-agent -agent secure protocol. 
And so none of this actually touches the ledger. When they get that proof, they'll go to Sovereign and they'll say, hey, what's the key for this particular credential definition? They'll look up the key, they'll verify that it's legitimate, they'll look at the revocation registry, which is how they know that it's not revoked, and then they'll verify that it's not revoked, and they'll know for sure that it's you, that it's, that it's correct, um, that it was issued by this hospital, um, but they, you didn't write anything to the letter. I think that one of the main issues in regarding identity is the use of companies. Because companies, many times they are used as a cover up for all kinds of illegal activities. And, and it's not just a question of admitting the company to the system, with its credentials so that it can act, but also of uh, controlling. Uh, during the time, long time, that things have not changed because otherwise you could buy a legal company and use it as a vehicle for other kinds of activities. So what I want to ask is if you have uh, any system regarding this controlling of, of this kind of, of companies and people who are behind the companies and all that. Okay, so uh, a company that, um, that maybe, or a company that's kind of a, a shell um, that is is acting um, maybe like for money laundering or something, right? Uh, I saw Breaking Bad. Um, you know, he had the car wash, uh, making millions of dollars a month in the car wash. Um, so you don't with self sovereign identity. You don't. Um, it's it's kind of a paradigm shift. But um, you don't prove that you're not something. Well, let's see. Um, you don't prove that you're not something. What you do is you prove that you are something. And the thing that you prove that you are could be, I can prove that I got an audit. Someone's looked at my books and has kind of done an analysis of me. Um, I could prove that I'm not a criminal by proving that I got a background check in the last week. Um, and so it's, it's really about um, bridging the gap between uh, something where you're strongly identifying um, to get uh, a, a credential, but then you can disclose the pieces that you want. Um, I, don't, I haven't thought much about what you're saying. Um, illegal activities is a uh, uh, conversation all the time, especially with KYC and um, I, I don't think you would look at sovereign or any identity system to um, guarantee that there's not um, a bad actor. In fact, it's important to note that um, anyone could issue a credential in Sovereign. Um, you have to have a way to, uh, the relying party has to decide if that issuer is someone that they trust. Um, if I trust um, the, the Bank of Spain, for example, then um, I'll trust a, a credential from, from the Bank of Spain. Um, if I don't know who a particular bank is or, or something, then I, I may not trust it. Um, and that's one of the things that trust frameworks help us with, is kind of bootstrapping uh, the organization, uh, who I can trust, the root of trust. Um, you saw on the stewards we had uh, InfoCert. InfoCert's uh, an identity company, think about it. They do certificates for businesses. And so you could decide, I trust InfoCert, and anybody who can generate some identity proofs from InfoCert credentials, I can trust them. Um, so there's, I, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Because it's a having third parties who can certify. Yeah. I, I think third parties who are doing the analysis and issuing credentials that then you can then use to, to prove that you're not something um, however that's accepted, I think that works pretty well. That implies that we are going to a place in which uh, we are going to have corporations, you have to pay them in order to get that trust, to buy trust, mm -hmm. or less the case. Well, I, I, think, um, I think there's kind of a, an evolution of identity at play here. Um, right now when we think about identity, we think about um, 
about uh, you know like a, a passport or a driver license or something. Um, I think you could start to prove things that are not purely kind of classical identity types of things. For example, there's a, a group um, that is finding a way to issue microloans to uh, individuals in third world countries based on their health activity. So if, if they go get vaccinations and they, they take their medicine or they do the, they go see the doctor regularly, that's, that behavior is an indication um, that they would also be responsible with a small loan. And so I think identity is going to change because you can see where um, I can have inputs from different places not coming into there and not just relying on just a couple of issuers. In that way, you are uh, somebody is able to identify you and, uh, and giving trust in your identity itself. And what is the difference with respect to the Facebook or similar institutions right now that are able to identify you anywhere, anytime, and as a leader of your life? So, um, I want to make sure I understand. I'm, I'm going in the way if there are these kind of institutions or corporations which are able to, to identify you in whatever conditions and give you your traceability in respect to your social life or criminal life or whatever. Yes. Why we are discussing all this or the coordinator of this kind of regulation for this? Because it's already done it. the system and it's working. Oh, it is working, but um, Facebook has all of your information. Facebook. It's centralized. Facebook is centralized. This is decentralized, you keep control about all the services. That's the thing, it's a, it's a corporation. For instance, CIA is buying millions <coughs> to Facebook with respect to people. A, a corporation, a company, if I want to know, I want to. I don't know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Hi, I want to hire you for my company, and I want to know your social life if you are able to do it. I pay Facebook. And they give me a report. Yeah, but all your these kind of solutions uh, allow you to avoid that. And you don't need to trust Facebook to keep proof of your identity. You keep your own system of credentials, which you can build with different assessments. For instance, you could have your invoice for your electricity, for your power. Then that information um, can be shown if you need to show your address. But you don't need to show that for other things. So you keep the information you want to to share and what information you don't want to share. I'm not finished with all that. But okay. <laughs> but you see the point, Maurice. Uh, on top of this, I think that oh, it's it's very clear that Facebook, Google, these companies own your digital footprint. Uh, as part of those applications for, for identity that you, uh, those use cases that you were like, uh, you didn't speak about that, but uh, this is uh, some of the use cases that I have in mind, is to empower the user, the final user, to be owner of their own data, to be owner of their own uh, digital, digital footprint, and enable him also to trade with that data they yes. produce. Somehow, no. Yeah. Is it is an economy ha, ha, around this? Have you have you thought uh, uh, about that use case? Can you yeah, share I mean, some thoughts? I, I haven't I haven't delved deeply on it, but there's there's kind of the notion of, of the me to be uh, instead of this B to B and B to C business models, right? Um, but we're talking me to be. It's 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 my data, um, and right now. Um, one company pays another company to, to get information about me. And with self-sovereign identity, um, the notion is that it kind of inverts that so that um, the companies can interact with me directly, I know what I'm sharing, and they, uh, I get to, to benefit myself from that sharing of information. Um, I, I think I mean, there's, there's estimates that that's a, a massive economy and that that's where it's going to go. Um, I, I don't have a lot of information about that, but once you start kind of switching the paradigm and changing things up a little bit, I think you start to enable new types of interactions that just weren't possible before. Yeah. The link to this, thank you very much for us for being here. We're really, really grateful. And it's super exciting. Um, a link to all this, uh, you know, we all know the, the, the sentence that you're, you're not paying your product. And right now the product is 
distributed somewhere in companies and we don't control it and all these things. So this will systematize data much more and it gives it to you, but we know that computers give it away very easily, uh, that companies ask you to give it away against the service very easily. So me, I am, for instance, a very private-oriented person, uh, but I, if you look at my phone and the applications I have in it, I've given away my data and I've agreed with, with pain, with, with severe pain to give it away, because I, otherwise I don't get the application and I can't relate to the whole world. So do you see a, do you see a risk that this happens again here, but with an extra level of riskiness in the sense that you have the, the data is much more systematized and much and much stronger yeah. and much broader and much everything. Yeah, I, I think the difference is um, I, I think the difference is I mean yes you could you could like right now I happened the other day and it really bothered me. Um, I won't name the company, um, but I I use the service to watch uh, streaming video. Okay. Um, it's a service that's very popular um, in the U.S. and Europe. And I went there, and I had this agreement <laughs> at the top. It's kind of thing that popped down, and it said, um, you have to agree to our terms and services, uh, terms and services, and our privacy policy changes, um, and click them here. So I clicked on them, and it was like it was like massive pages. Um, and then and then I went back, and I'm like, I don't want to agree to this. And it said. Um, if you don't agree to it, um, click here to cancel your subscription. Um, that's, there's a name for that. It's called a, uh, uh, Should be illegal in any case. Yeah. <laughs> is it, uh, it is not, it's not currently not it. illegal and it's currently happening. And it can happen again uh, within yeah. this framework, actually, yeah. you know? And I, and I, so it's, so yes, you could get into a world where you're using Sovereign and and everyone's asking for everything and clicking through everything. But um, I mean, I can imagine that kind of dystopian future. Um, but I think when you shift things so that the incentives are adjusted um, and it's not people trading about you and it's, you're in the middle of this, um, I think people will start to say, wait a second, you're asking for too much. And some of the UIs that we're talking through um, are, you know, where someone asks for something, and you say, "I'll give you that, 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 but not that. You don't need that." <coughs> and and they get to decide. And, hey, I mean, it's a negotiation, and and it's not. Uh, I don't know. It, it's going to be interesting it's, to see it's, how it plays Currently, out. it's not really working. Yeah. Currently, we also have the possibility to say no to certain things, and actually. Yeah. We don't do because we really want a service and we don't have an option to pay for the service, for we're instance. We're only one. Sorry? We're only one person, right? Uh, so this is where I think other blockchain technologies can come into play. Like you can imagine a completely decentralized video streaming service where more of the, of the uh, data, more of, sorry, more of the money goes to the films, right? You can imagine this for artists. You can imagine this for... Um, you know all kinds of scenarios. So I think I think the whole blockchain um, movement and technology uh, technology are actually is moving us toward systems that are more democratic um, along those lines. And I think I think those types of things will start to go away. But um, but and I also had this idea. I'll just share this idea real really quick. Um, you know, in a class action lawsuit, um, you have one per, per, party that stands up and says, I'm going to represent uh, a class of people, because no one is going to stand step forward and go through the effort individually, because their return is only $10. But uh, you know, a million people have been affected by $10, so I'm going to, I'm going to take this, this on. Um, I can imagine kind of a, kind of a class action type of uh, a thing where someone says, you know what, this, this isn't right. Um, you know, can we, uh, can I rally people that are in a situation that don't like the fact that they had to sign this agreement to get the access to this? Can I rally them together? Um, because Sovereign has this, you know, privacy respecting thing. You could actually use Sovereign um, to, to kind of create a consensus of people that can then move in, in uh, as a group. 
instead of one person going, oh, I hate this, and then getting okay. And then and everybody doing that. I, I think it's kind of a bold new world, and I think we need to... But, but I think their business is getting your info in exchange of free services. Say, what's up? It's, yeah. a, it's a, we couldn't live without it nowadays, okay? But they asked me if they could have access to my... Yeah, I know, I live If they could have access to my... Uh, passwords. Why do they need to have access to uh, to my and change my passwords? That because doesn't make sense. Has a price in the market. I know. I know. This is the problem. Yes, I know everything. My data and everything they use. But the option is well, it's, it's Telegram. I think that's the solution to migrate to other platforms and other services which are decentralized. Because now they have all our data, and we cannot use Facebook. We can change switch from WhatsApp to Telegram, which is open source and that kind of thing. So I think that may be the solution, to migrate from decentralized services, free, to some new ones. But meanwhile, we have to stick on it. I, I think we're going to get more and more options. Um, it feels right now like we're, uh, like we don't have a lot of options. Um, and, and we keep giving us better and better services. Um, I, I use um, Google Apps. Um, I use Google Mail. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'd do without them. And I don't like that I just said that. <laughs> um, Welcome to the club. <laughs> yeah. So, but you know, I was talking to someone, um, uh, Lehman Baird, uh, who's one of the founders mm -hmm. of Hashgraph, said that um, he, ha he thinks that he could build uh, a decentralized version of Google Docs. And I'd love to see that. I think that'd be awesome. Uh -huh. I don't. I, I think that'd be great. We are in the town of a new era, and this is the kind of tool we are going to use in the future. So we so. need to learn this because this is the kind of thing we are going to use, say, ten years from now. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we're we're just. Question. Yeah. 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 I think for a top. I think there is like a, an example, like, let, let me know if you think it will work. Uh, for example, Google, uh, they make uh, the money, but not directly, but with the, our information. They don't send directly, this guy is sending this email to this person, always surfing around this data. They detect kind of trend. What happens if they can detect that trend without the personal information of these people? This is what you mentioned about banks. I'm sure the bank doesn't want your password. I'm sure, I'm sure they don't want to stop your password. I'm sure yeah. that. I develop with them this kind of matter. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure uh, this is cheap. They're going to pay you for that and install the password with your system anyway. With Google, I think it's the same. They want the information to gather the knowledge behind it yeah. and sell it. States that they have friends that sell that kind of stuff. If you can get that information anonymously, it's safe for them, it's safe for us, and uh, you create knowledge that is good for everyone. Um, you can sell it safely, at least. I, I hope so. I, I, I really do hope so. Um, I, um, I, I hope that someday um, I could, if, if you can separate me from my browsing history. Right? Um, it, it bothers me that, and I don't know that that's really possible, but um, could I, right now in the US, um, ISPs can now, um, there's some tracking that they can now do on, on your browsing history. And it really bothers me. And so, whenever I'm online, I'm using a VPN. And, <laughs> um, but if, if someone came to me and said, look, um, it, here's a way for you to share your browsing history anonymously, and in exchange for that, we're going to give you twelve dollars a year or whatever. And and I mean, I guess I don't really care much about that. What I care about would be something about medical. So um, let's say that let's say that there's a, a scanner in my house that like monitors what I eat, uh, monitors my weight, monitors my sleeping patterns, like intimately my sleeping patterns. Um, monitors everything about me. 
I wouldn't want like that to send that out. But that was anonymous, and and the, the thing I got from that was um, kind of a, an indication that hey, um, people that exhibit your sleep and eating and, and exercise patterns um, die five years earlier. Or or I think we're going to get to a, a, a time where they say you know what. Um, you have a, a you have a 27 percent chance higher um, chance of contracting this kind of disease in the next 10 years unless you change this um, because because there's enough tracking valuable tracking information but not tied to me anyway I, I envision some really cool stuff there that's kind of like I mean it's going to take a while to get there but I think that's possible. <laughs> Uh, how how do you see uh, the co-living with, uh, with from uh, serving with other identity solutions? Do you see some competition competence there? Or um, there there are other um, so you know there's huge companies built around identity. There's federated identity. There's no, I'm talking about self sovereignty identities. Oh, uh, things like Uport or yeah. I think Civic is another one. I don't yeah, know. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, Uport, um, Blockstack, uh, mm -hmm. Civic. Um, these are people that are doing identity on distributed ledger. Um, and they're doing it at varying levels, right? Um, it's tough to say those three like in the same in the same um, phrase because they, they are doing it quite different levels. Um, I think Uport is um, probably the closest to doing it um, to the level that we are. Um, but I think what's going to happen over time is we'll get some convergence, and there already is some convergence on on parts of the protocol. For example, um, there's a standard called PIDs, uh, distributed identifiers. Um, this is a URN that um, you can use that um, contains the letters PID, colon, and then some sort of method. And the sovereign met method is SOB. Um, and, and so you can have others that are in the space have different methods. And so you can have kind of these universal identifiers to use. Um, you know, sovereign with pairwise identifiers kind of goes to the next level there. Um, but I think I think you can see some convergence um, from the VID spec. Um, EPMS would also kind of be a point of convergence, um, and you know the whole verifiable claims W3C verifiable uh, credentials working group that we're a part of. Um, I think we're going to see convergence there. So we're bringing to bear kind of the pseudonymous. Uh, signature suite for that specification, and so more we continue to kind of play in these uh, standards organizations and influence that, the more you can see an interoperable um, protocol. So I think I think um, it's a little bit early right now because um, kind of everyone's doing their own. Um, I think you pick the one that's kind of the best thought out. Mm. So. Uh, but I, I do think that there's, um, I mean, the you folks are doing good work, and they're sharp guys, and uh, so I would continue to come to this space, and uh, we'll see some divergence, I'm sure.